Luke, Roger, welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us, John. So uh, what I love to have my guests do is just uh, say a, a few words about yourself. So uh, Luke, why don't you introduce yourself? Who is Luke? Yeah, my name is Luke Bornheimer, uh, and I am a sustainable transportation advocate here in San Francisco, California. I have been doing this work for about three years now, and it started. my work started largely around car-free JFK promenade and leading organizing and advocacy for making that permanent. And then that, you know, kind of dipped my toes in it and then led to many other things, including advocacy around Great Highway Park and slow streets and protected bike lanes throughout the city. And, you know, some context for me, my, my reason for doing this is largely about, you know, the environment, sustainability, and making our cities more livable places to live. And so that's what kind of motivates me to help create this positive change in San Francisco and beyond. Fantastic. Roger, how about you? Um, I'm the editor of Streets Blog San Francisco, which as you both know, and I imagine most of the the viewers know, is a publication with uh, branches in New York and National and Chicago and Los Angeles that covers the safe and livable streets movement. Um, I've been, uh, I guess if you include the time I was freelancing, I've been with Streets Blog for about 10 years, and uh, I was with the National Public Radio affiliate before that in Los Angeles. And I've been a journalist who specializes in transportation for, um, well, not to date myself too much here, but about 30 years. At one time or another, I've done pieces for television, radio, print about transit, about bike lanes. And I was a transportation commentator as well for a while on radio. And I think the thing that first got me started down this path was growing up in suburban New York and seeing the contrast between a car dominated suburb and this wonderful city that I had access to if I could drive to the train station to get there. And then, uh, you know, I bought into the whole cars of the path to freedom thing that we all kind of grow up with in the US of A. And then I saw a kid uh, get hit in a terrible crash on the big highway near where I grew up. And it really changed me. And I found a lot of people get into the the safe and livable streets movement because of uh, seeing something or experiencing something like that. So that's my background in a nutshell. Yeah. And, and and apparently you're also a movie star too. I mean, look at this. Yeah, occasionally when yeah. I run into Clarence with street films. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll I'll put this on in, in the background and and yeah, this is uh, Clarence had the opportunity to to head over to um, the Bay Area and shoot a whole bunch of uh, videos and and here you are uh, the the superstar that you are. <laughs> so so talk a little bit about this, uh, Roger and Luke, both of you is you know in the Bay Area we're we're seeing some progress being made and I think that's really what was being highlighted here at the point. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of progress in the Bay Area. It's very uneven. But one of the things that's done really well is, you know, and for people who don't know the Bay Area, Alameda is uh, kind of a near end suburb to the city. And I wrote a piece uh, a few months ago that Clarence really liked. And so we met out there and, and shot the video that you're looking at in the background there. But basically, it's an all new housing development that was built on a former Navy base. And Star Trek fans will recognize it. It's, uh, I think there's a shot of it somewhere in here of the nuclear vessels from, uh, from one of the Star Trek movies. But, and there's an airplane, uh, you know, is sort of alluding to the past of the area. But the uh, city managers in Alameda are just incredibly progressive. And they insisted that this new housing development have raised uh, sidewalk level protected bike lanes that you see right here. And they have succeeded in, in the dream of the 15 minute city. Basically, you've got all your housing right there. You know, it's still, they're still filling it up because it is absolutely brand new, but there's ground level shopping. These bike lanes actually lead all the way to the ferry terminal that they just built uh, with a 20 minute ride to downtown San Francisco from here, from all this housing. So it's, it's really an example of what the Bay Area and cities throughout the country can accomplish if they put their mind to it and really do the work, the advanced planning and everything and, and not just kind of relapse into, oh yeah, we need you know, huge parking lots for people. How else will people get anywhere? And, you know, there is some parking in this community, no doubt about it. But as you can see from these pictures, you know, you can let your kids ride around. I mean, it's, it's safe. Yeah. 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 I I love it too, that, you know, a, we're able to kind of really highlight some infrastructure that when you have a situation like this, where you can build a community from the ground up, you can put in truly authentic all ages and abilities facilities 
you look at this, you know, protected bike lane here and you saw that they, uh, that in that particular section of it, you know, you, you had some rain garden, uh, facilities. So you, you, you have that ability to, to, you know, really help, you know, with groundwater and stormwater runoff and things of that nature. I, I, it's just, it makes me so happy to see, you know, that level of infrastructure being put in. And it, it really helps too, when you can, do it right from the from the get go when you you know really have authentic, beautiful, and functional uh, facilities and, and and really getting that authentic uh, protection in. And Luke, I'm going to channel uh, something that you posted yesterday uh, for for the next you know for a carry on to that of of that. And 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 this was a post that you uh, said you know, you're like advocacy organizations. I'm begging you to stop referring to plastic posts separated bike lanes as protected. Thank you so much for saying that and speaking up. I get it. I'm not overly negative of cities using lighter, quicker, cheaper materials to reserve the the real estate and make it, you know, put it in. But what we just saw from Alameda, that's protected infrastructure. This is not. Talk a little bit about why you felt, you know, so, you know, moved to have to, you know, you know, basically call out our other advocacy organizations, national include and also uh, NACDO about this particular subject. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's it's something that I've been seeing over the past three years and slowly noticing the, you know, the tendency, you know, both for advocacy organizations, but definitely for transportation agencies and DOTs around the country to more and more almost universally refer to post-separated bike lanes as protected. Um, and, I, and I get it from their perspective, right? Like they want to say that we created X number of miles of protected bike lanes. And so if you can put a post, a, you know, plastic post in the ground and call it protected, that's great. You just like your ROI on a post, on a $40 post is really high. Right. But as we all know, plastic posts aren't protection. And so, you know, it's a very dangerous precedent for transportation agencies to set. And, and really, I'm, I'm most disappointed in NACTO, who's kind of seen as this gold standard that everyone looks up to, who multiple places on their website and their materials show photos of post-separated bike lanes as protected bike lanes. And I think that sets a very dangerous precedent. And, you know, as far as advocacy organizations go, you know, I as a, you know, I'm a community organizer first and an advocate, you know, close second. And I see the job as an advocate as like setting the ideal, like what we need to strive for. And so when advocacy organizations start saying that a post-separated bike lane is a protected bike lane, they are giving permission to transportation agencies, to local legislators, to mayors, to governors to say, great, we've checked that box. People wanted protected bike lanes. They said a plastic post-separated bike lane is a protected bike lane. We achieved our mission. And so it puts advocates and, you know, in a very vulnerable position and, and more tangibly and, vo- and viscerally people in a vulnerable position to be injured or killed because plastic posts aren't protection. And so I, I would like to see advocacy organizations make that shift to specifically defining what a protected bike lane is, notably, you know, protected by parked cars. Bye bye. <laughs> Well, uh, I guess I'll pick that up then. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so one of the problems with soft hit posts, as you know, we saw in, in Luke's picture. Sorry, Luke. I was I, let me finish this thought and we'll, we'll throw it back to you. But you know, those those posts. If you watch the advertisements from the manufacturers of those posts, they highlight the fact that they won't damage an automobile and won't stop an automobile. They'll well, spring back up to this yeah, car right yeah. over it. So that's Roger, not the, the definition whole, of protection. The, the, right. the, the whole point is, 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 yes, the manufacturers literally call them flex posts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and soft or soft or they, or safe or they also hit call posts. them they call them safe hit posts, right? Because they're you know, safe that's for your the other car. Term they use yeah, they're safe, safe for your car. Just turned yes, on its head, yes. like that's what are we doing here, right? You know, so we our, our priority is to make sure that the moron who you know had six martinis before he got behind the wheel, or you know, or is looking at his or her cell phone and, and swerves into the bike lane, our priority should not be to protect that person's car, right? 
And we have too many cases in the Bay Area. There are a few that come to mind of, of drunk drivers or distracted drivers actually killing people right. on lanes that had that kind of protection and just drove right over it. Yeah. So, you know, it's to Luke's point, you know, for advocates to to jump on that bandwagon and start calling them protected lanes. You know, I, I don't think it's intentional, but, you know, they, they just need to think about it a little bit more. We need we need different words so we know what we're talking about. Yeah. And, and, and Luke, uh, you, you channeled the exact phrase that I used uh, when I you know, highlighted a brand new facility, you know, close to, to the house here in Austin. And, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to call these protected bike lanes because it's just, you know, some armadillos and some and some, uh, you know, flex posts. I, I like to you know, call them enhanced separation in the sense that it's better than just a buffer. And it's better than just a painted bike lane. And so it, it, it's it's a it's a step in the right direction. It's this incremental step. But yeah, don't call it protection when it's not really protection. You know, if we're going to have concrete barriers or parked cars. Yes. How I how I think about it is, you know, it's kind of like a grading system. Right. And again, this is this is a lot of why, you know, my strongest disappointment is in NACTO is like, they are seen as this gold standard that should create side of a grading system. And I see it as a gold standard, like you've got fully protected or, or frankly, fully separated off street paths, um, like you see throughout the Netherlands. Um, that's the gold standard. And then there's this like intermediary step, which I think it should be called that. It's an intermediary step that there's separation done by paint and posts that is a step towards that gold standard. And, you know, I, I want to be clear that you know, I, I understand the value and I support quick build projects to get us to more separated and protected bike lanes. And they should be very explicitly a step towards that. And so speaking, you know, within San Francisco, over the past 10 years, largely quick build projects using paint and posts have been installed and never updated to concrete. And even worse, the plastic posts are run over and damaged or completely destroyed. And so there are bike lanes, separated bike, previously separated bike lanes that SFMTA calls protected that have zero plastic posts separating them. So they're actually just painted bike lanes. But, you know, uh, you know according to official city documents and, and numbers, those are protected bike lanes. And so that is, that is a very dangerous precedent to set. It also frankly, messes with data. You know, if we're reporting on crash data and injury data on protected bike lane segments that, that aren't actually protected, our data is wrong. Right. Yeah. Cause then you're, you're listing collisions and protected bike lanes, which aren't actually protected. And the image you have of New York here is kind of an example of how um, soft hit posts should be used, which is you're, you're giving the motorist a warning, Hey, there's a concrete planter behind here. And as far as getting quick build in there, I, I mean, there's no problem with doing quick build with plastic posts and I think, and, and doing it quickly and inexpensively. And I think Emeryville does it very, very well. They have a project on Doyle Street. Um, I wish we had a picture of it, but they use plastic posts, but they're gray. So they look like concrete and interspersed with those gray posts are actual surplus garbage cans that Emeryville had in a warehouse that they decided not to use anymore. And they just put um, these like, plywood discs over the top so you can't use it as a garbage can anymore. But it actually looks really pretty. It was it was really smart. It cost them no more than any other of these, you know, plastic installations. But you don't see the post knocked down. You do see some chips out of the garbage cans occasionally from when a motorist tried to to wander into it. But you know, when someone's driving past, if they see something that looks like concrete, they generally don't run into it unless they really are distracted. And in Doyle Street they learn really fast when they get their their bill from the body shop um, not to do that anymore. But if we advertise the fact that, hey, this is a plastic straw, it's just it's not going to work with a subset of drivers who are truly irresponsible. Yeah. 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 And, and we've you know, we've we've unfortunately seen the degradation of these efforts and the, these you know materials for infrastructure in that when quick build programs were initially created, the whole thought was you install something within one to three months, you evaluate it, you make tweaks you study it for like a year, and then you move to concrete or more permanent materials. In San Francisco, our quick builds take 12 to 
36 months to actually be approved and installed with quick build materials. They're almost never upgraded to permanent materials and they degrade over time. And so it checks a box. Um, everyone celebrates it as we have new protected bike lanes and then they degrade over time. And so, so yeah, I, I think, you know, my, my effort and my hope here is that advocacy organizations and organizations like NACTO kind of make a course correction and really publish definitions around like, what is a protected bike lane? What is a separated bike lane? And are there other definitions we want to define? And when, you know, what is the gold standard and what are we, when should a separated bike lane be used and for how long? Um, and probably the best example I've seen of this process is in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where they passed the Cambridge Cycling Safety Ordinance to implement a connected network of protected bike lanes around town. And they said, hey, you know, we're going to install these protected bike lanes or sidewalk level bike lanes as we repave streets. And if we're not going to repave a street within the next five years, we'll install a quick build design. And then when the street is being repaved, we'll then actually come back and use concrete and, and install permanent. And, and it's, it's just working incredibly well. And is a is a true model, I think, for for the world, not even just the United States, that other cities should be replicating. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, Luke is absolutely right. I mean, I, I think Cambridge has the correct idea. But you know, I mentioned that in the Bay Area, things are very uneven. One of the things that's frustrated the hell out of me is um, I live in Oakland, and there you have a you know the streets in Oakland are, are infamous for potholes. They finally got a measure passed, and they have money to do repaving, and they've been. They have some great projects going on that are absolutely stellar, but you know your average street when they go through and repave it, they just repave it and they put the door zone bike lane right back where it was, and it's frustrating as hell, you know, to to have that happen over and over and over again. And then the DOT directors will say, "Well, we don't have money for protected bike lanes." I'm like, "Yeah, you do. You just spent it. You you just threw it away." And we also, to contrast that development in Alameda, we have a development in Brooklyn Basin that just went in. And they, comp they basically built a new street from scratch and uh, a new sidewalk and rain gardens and everything. And then our advocates had to go back in after they, like, as the asphalt was drying and say, wait a minute, there's no bike lane here. And they had to go back in and retrofit it with plastic straws again. And it's like, you know, uh, it's so frustrating because then we, we hear repeatedly, we don't have the money to do it. And that particular development, Brooklyn Basement, just drives me nuts. They actually did build a sidewalk level protected bike lane, but it's, they treat it as a recreational path. It doesn't go anywhere. It's on the interior of the housing complex. And even though they're only a mile from the, from the BART station, it, it doesn't help you get there at all. And even to get to that bike lane is, is pretty treacherous. So, you know, this, this is what we're up against as advocates. And I, I think Luke is absolutely right in stressing that, first of all, we need systemic fixes to this, that, you know, there have to be very strict guidelines or, or we have to legislate. We have to have laws that say when you put a new street in, you got to do it this way. And I think also key to that to get us on track is, yeah, we need the advocacy groups to, to, to understand that what we're looking at here. Well, I mean, this is the right way, to, again, to use plastic posts, um, you know, with at least, an, at least on an interim temporary basis. I mean, you, you, you've got these in and thank you very much, Luke, for for um, sending these over. These are some some photos that you snapped uh, in New York City. Um, and I and since we were talking about these flex posts, I, I'm like, ah, let's let's throw a few of these up. I know you were there for Vision Zero and I know you were there connecting with uh, some of my buddies in the bike bus world. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about bike bus in, in just a little bit. I do want to mention, though, that one of the things that we need to kind of keep in mind, too, is that this concept of, of protection is a little bit of a, a false sense of security in the sense that, like, for instance, when we look at some of the quote unquote protection or separated bike lanes in the Netherlands, oftentimes it's it's just simply a, a little bit of an elevation of like maybe three inches, you know, from the, the motorway, the real true quote unquote protection of the whole, whole system in, in that sort of scenario is the fact that they're also driving much slower. That street is much more likely to be a 30 kilometer per hour street and then true physical separation with a protected uh, facility or, or a parking protected lane um, might come about 
on uh, or or literally, like you said, Luke, a, a completely physically separated pathway away from the street, uh, you know, short shows up when it's a street that is 50 kilometers per hour. And that's really their dividing line is anything above 30 kilometers per hour, you need, you know, protection and separation. And increasingly in the Netherlands, at least they're starting to come to the realization looking at the serious injuries and fatality rates on those 50 kilometer per hour streets uh, that pretty much anything within the cities, within the urban core area needs to be 30 kilometer per hour. So really it's speed. That is the the key thing that we need to do in terms of the key factor we need to deal with in terms of bringing motor vehicle speeds down. And then that really sort of opens up a whole bunch more opportunities, uh, you know, because we're, we're not dealing with that that lethal speed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and John, on, on that note, I, you know, I like to think of this as kind of thinking about like what problems do we face and like what what are the solutions or what's the solution to those problems and so when i look at the problems that we face as a country as a planet you know we've got a roadway safety crisis that is getting worse in the united states we've got a climate crisis which is getting worse in the united states and around the world and we've got a public health crisis throughout the united states both mental and physical and so what i come back to often is mode shift. So, you know, absolutely speeds matter. And when conflicts happen, when crashes happen, speed matters a lot, especially if it's a, if it's a car or a truck. And, you know, the countries and the cities around the world that have really made progress on vision zero, on climate action and on public health have gotten people to shift trips from cars to active transportation and public transportation. Um, and so that's that's what a lot of my focus is now is for San Francisco, for the United States, is really having people focus more on mode shift. And that includes and is very notably related to infrastructure and policy. So installing protected bike lanes, protected intersections, and, and notably making them connected in a network will get many more people shifting modes, which reduces the number of cars on our roads and also increases the, the percentage of our, of our cities that use a bike for transportation at some time in their life, which we know from the Netherlands is a really critical part because basically everyone rides a bike at some point. And so everyone's aware of people riding bikes and being careful around them. And so, yeah, I mean, I would love to see a day where we, where in the United States, we can have kind of, you know, separated bike lanes that don't really have substantial protection but right now, we to get more people to shift trips from cars to active transportation, those people need to feel safe and actually be safe. Um, and the the proven way to do that is is installing a connected network of protected bike lanes, you know, in every city around the country. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to add to that, you know, the streets in the Netherlands at our lower speed are either they're already narrow because just the houses are close together. Um, or they've narrowed them with planters and and parklets and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, it, we absolutely, um, you know, protected bike lanes aren't the right solution for every single street if we're dealing with a, a low volume residential street. But, you know, if you're going to do that, you have to design the street to force slow automobile speeds. You can't just put a sign up that says, you know, speed limit is 25K or, or 15 MPH or uh, trying to convert my head there, but, you know, you need to have, you know, I, I wish we had some pictures of the street I just mentioned in Emeryville, but yeah, there, there's concrete blocks. There's a lot of similar things to what you just saw in New York City where, yeah, I mean, you can't drive fast through there. If you drive fast, you're going to crash into something right away. So, I mean, that's how you get those lower speeds. And then, yeah, you don't, you don't technically need a, you know, a thoroughly protected bike lane because the speeds are low enough that you should be okay most of the time, but you need to do both those things. I'd like to emphasize too, that especially in the Netherlands, uh, and, and also in, in Copenhagen, Denmark as well, is that about 70% of their entire cycle network is actually considered shared space. Mm -hmm. It's not protected and separated uh, cycle network infrastructure. It's actually low speed, slow speed, residential community. Uh, and, and it's really, you know, if it's, if there's actually no 
facilities for pedestrians, and it's true sort of Vunair uh, type of space. It's typically a, a 15 kilometer per hour uh, zone, but if it's just shared between people on bikes and people in cars, then it's a 30 kilometer per hour zone. And the materials on those streets, uh, the feet struts and whatnot, are you know it, typically in brick, red or or red pave, red asphalt, uh, really sending the message that this is not a space for drivers to drive fast. It's it, it's really people priority space, and so it, it sends a different message. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have an example of that uh, here in Oakland and Jack London Square uh, along the waterfront. It's, you know, it's all pavers. It's, it's really bumpy if you tried to go fast, even on a bicycle. Um, and there's steel bollards that sort of, you know, make it impossible to drive through so that, you know, you have to kind of remove them to make delivery. So it's, it's kind of access only. There's other sections you can drive through. The posted speed limit is five miles per hour. But you, you couldn't go much faster than five miles per hour. There's just too much stuff. There's a lot of trees and fountains and, and as I mentioned, bollards and grassy areas and Yeah. I mean, it's funny. It's been here for so long. I don't really think of it as an example of how to build a street anymore because it's just kind of there. It's just Um, there, yeah. But it's it's actually very similar to the Vunerif. So now we're looking at Valencia and and let's let's dive into this because this is a rather complicated and 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 difficult one. So this is a protected section of it. Luke, walk us through the challenge that is Valencia. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just uh, as you described this. So what we're seeing here is Valencia Street. And this is what the actually protected bike lane looks like between Market and 15th Streets. So the very northern end of Valencia Street, um, it's a four block stretch, has parking protected bike lanes that are, you know, actually protected and along the curb. So easy for people to stop, go to a business um, and then turn on and off the street. South of 15th Street, so starting at 15th Street and going down to 23rd Street, there was just a paint-only unprotected bike lane for many years, for decades. And, you know, there had been a lot of desire. It's a main bike corridor in the city. It also happens to be a vibrant merchant corridor, heavy, you know, amount of, you know, a large number of people walking on the sidewalks, crossing streets, going to businesses, and, you know, commercial activity for for merchants getting deliveries or, or having deliveries picked up. And so there had been a lot of desire to improve the bike facilities on Valencia and notably install, you know, protected bike lanes um, so that people were safe and that, you know, help businesses because we know that protected bike lanes lead to more business for for merchants and lower commercial vacancies. Can I ask one quick question here? Um, so, so this is a four block section of, of this sort of treatment. Are there any, any sort of ballers or any sort of... Flex pose, <laughs> uh, trying to discourage drivers from parking in the bike lane or driving down the bike lane? No, and it, it does happen from time to time. And also, I, I just want to say the intersections are not particularly well done on this section. Um, the intersections are not protected. But in, uh, you know, sort of after a lot of advocacy work, we finally got a plan on the books in 2020, just before the pandemic started. Uh, to get this kind of treatment extended, uh, you know, much farther down Valencia. So we would have protected bike lanes um, and protected intersections moving forward. Uh, And that project got canceled um, for kind of inexplicable reasons shortly as the COVID pandemic hit. And then basically nothing happened for many years. And then just a few months ago, they installed a section of center running bike lane. Uh, which is kind of new and yeah, and <laughs> here was almost the immediate result in this next picture here. So this has been an incredibly contentious issue because when they did the outreach about installing a center running bike lane, uh, the vast majority, I, I mean, Luke, I th- what was it like 80% of the respondents? Yeah, in a three month long outreach process, 13% of respondents supported the center bike way design that SFMTA proposed. So nobody wants it. This is what we're going to do is basically what happened. Who really wanted it that direction or that design? I mean, the short the short answer is that policymakers were essentially playing politics. They were trying to thread the needle and pick the least controversial thing possible. We see this over and over again in San Francisco, a bunch of half measure infrastructure projects where someone is trying to not piss off anybody or piss them them all off equally. And so they design and implement a, a 
a project that doesn't satisfy any of the objectives, kind of pisses everyone off and doesn't move, make progress at all for the city or for the planet. And so that's exactly what happened here, you know. Ostensibly, it was about car loading. Yeah, it was supposed to preserve. It was, it was car parking. Loading. It was. Yeah. It, I mean, it was. It was car parking. So, <laughs> oh, uh, Luke, you should have just led with that. It's all about yeah, parking. It's oh, all about. Okay, it, got it. Does everyone know that at this point? But and and this this video here illustrates that perfectly. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so I, you know, I I emailed with, you know, I was in communications with SFMTA staff prior to the center bike way design being formally proposed and approved and asked, you know, why, because I was advocating for curbside protected bike lanes with protected intersections. And I essentially was asking, why haven't you created a design for curbside protected bike lanes? And point blank, the answer was, if we installed curbside protected bike lanes between 15th and 19th streets, where the roadway is narrower, we could not have parking on both sides of the street. So just point blank, it was about parking. And ultimately, what that comes down to, as you know very well, John, from throughout the United States, that's a political decision because it's like a short term. People will be angry about parking. Let's try and minimize anger and controversy. And so we'll just not do the thing that we know is actually best. And then, you know, once that decision was made, there's a bunch of justifications around like why this is actually better. And, you know, we could, you know, it was it was said with no with no proof that if we didn't install the center bike way, we wouldn't do anything for two to three years. No one showed their work on that. It was just said. And then everyone just kind of adopted it. They're like, oh, we can't have anything if we don't do this terrible design. And so, yeah, essentially it was parking and it was it was people playing politics rather than prioritizing people's safety, the planet and, and you know, notably business because the center bike way has been bad for business, too. I want to play this little video clip again. So whoever wants to like narrate over yeah, well, what we're going to about to see. I mean, keep in mind, left turns are banned. That's supposed to be the solution to some of the dangerous movements you're about to see. But yeah, well also, I mean, I, you know, I took this video while riding my bike to go pick up my daughter from school. And you'll also note that these people are driving in the center bike way. So they That's are. That's what I wanted somebody to say. <laughs> yeah. 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 So like, so, you know, people, and, and I see this every day, I ride on Valencia almost every single day, and, and I see all the time drivers who are just genuinely confused, understandably, because this design is a one-of-a-kind design that makes no sense, and, it, and it's dangerous, and it makes, it's bad, it's just, it's unintuitive, um, and so, yeah, people do all sorts of strange and dangerous behavior all day long, and none of them are doing it out of malice. They're just genuinely confused and don't know how to use the road, because, They've never seen something like this before. And notably, it's a terrible idea. Um, so it's not like, oh, they've never seen this before and it's a great idea. And we'll all figure it out and then it'll be great. And we'll have them everywhere. It's like, oh, no, this is a terrible idea. Everyone's confused. Please, someone with the authority and power to do something, stop it. Like, please stop it before someone gets killed. Yeah, and I don't, I don't live anywhere near it. I've seen two people get hurt already, one that required an ambulance. Yeah. You know, that's without visiting it that frequently. But, you know, you can see with all these crazy movements going on how that can happen. And, you know, we we also have heard accounts of um, a, a colleague of ours who actually lives on Valencia at 18th, watched somebody end up on the hood of a car, fortunately wasn't hurt too badly and, and sort of brushed himself off and got it and walked away from it. But um, we've had a pedestrian killed actually since this went in. Now, there were a couple of pedestrian deaths in the years prior, but it, it's a little strange that one has happened already. And, you know, I know Luke and I both believe it's, it's because of all this confusion. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think I think uh, what I like to point out, with, you know, with that that 80 year old man who was killed uh, while crossing the street. Unfortunately, SFMTA has taken the official position that the center bikeway had nothing to do with his death. And besides that just being ridiculous, it's a dangerous precedent to set that when you install something in a roadway, specifically in the middle of a roadway, it has no contribution to crashes, deaths, and injuries that happen on that roadway. That's, that's an insane proposition. If you put a garbage truck in the middle of the street, you would say, yeah, that probably contributed to that crash. But because the agency wants to support this center bikeway, they are doing everything they can to defend it as if it's not actually a bad thing. And so, you know, we're not only seeing a disservice to the public, but frankly, dangerous behavior from, you know, government 
employees and, and policymakers who are both either essentially covering this up or not taking action. You know, so the, the amount of people who wanted curbside protected bike lanes or pedestrianization of the street before the vote and the approval and even still greatly outnumbers, we're talking six to eight times as many people, you know, which coincidentally lines up with the 13 percent support. So another note of maybe the same 13 percent of people like this thing. And unfortunately, despite all of that organizing, that advocacy, people pointing out crashes and injuries, the only people with the power and authority to do something about it, notably Jeffrey Tumlin, who's the executive director of SFMTA, his board of directors, and Mayor London Breed are doing nothing, literally not taking action at all, not even commenting on it. And so that inaction is quite literally leading to people crashing, being killed, and being injured. So, I mean, I don't want any individual to face negative consequences from this. I just want people to be safe. I want us to have good bike infrastructure. I want businesses to recover on Valencia Street. And I want us to make action on climate change. And the center of running bike line does none of those things. What you're looking at here is there's a local artist who's also a cyclist and lives right off of Valencia. And uh, she was just super frustrated with it. And during construction, she <laughs> made these fake uh, stickers and stuck them on top of, I'm sorry, we don't have more pictures of this, but it's funny, but it's, it's almost, there's nothing left to do but laugh at this, as horrible as that is. But we're kind of stuck with it for the time being. Yeah, good luck, cyclists, indeed. Yeah, it, it, it seems as if, and we're, now we're back to, to this, this final shot here. It seems as if, you know, when you mention, you know, London Breed, you know, the mayor and, and Jeffrey Tumlin, the executive director of SFMTA, it's, it's like, okay, at some point in time, you, 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 you're a journalist, Roger, and, and, and Luke, you're, you're a community organizer. It sounds like the community has to, to really speak up and come together so that they understand in massive numbers that, the, you know, no, this, this isn't the, the direction that we need to go. You mentioned it just in passing pedestrianization of the entire street. Tell me more. I, I mean, that would be great. Uh, that's complicated. There's driveways, there's residences on the street. So, you know, obviously we can't tell someone they can't drive to their driveway anymore. Well, and, um, and when we say pedestrianization, you know, when we think of a street that is pedestrian priority, like in the Netherlands, yeah, it, it basically means this is not a through street. You know, if somebody needs to take a delivery, they need to get to a driveway. It's what we were talking about before. It becomes like a, you know, a 15 kilometer per hour zone type of thing, a, an ultra low speed zone. So I think everyone is more or less on the same page about this. So there, there's a subset of exceptions. But, you know, either we have to get uh, truly protected bike lanes and intersections in here, or we have to make entire blocks of the street access only where, you know, a, a, you can drive onto it, let's say, in one direction. There'd be a lot of obstacles and barriers. You can, you know, there's a lot of burrito shops on Valencia. So just as an example, you can stop off and get your burrito and then drive on and then you have to turn off Valencia again. You know, that seems appropriate for many blocks of Valencia. And we can do some sort of mix, perhaps, of protected bike lanes for a lot of it and then uh, pedestrianization slash access only, you know, for the other blocks. This is something that I think the vast majority probably of the merchants, I mean, certainly the merchants that we've talked to, I think a lot of drivers would actually like that too, because we've got major thoroughfares, you know, very close and parallel, such as Guerrero and basically any other street in the mission. So it's it's not like we need this as an automobile thoroughfare. We kind of need it as a bicycle thoroughfare because of the top topography of San Francisco. It's just if you're if you're trying to get between downtown and the rest of the city, this is this is your preferred route. So yeah, I mean, why that isn't happening, you know, I find it kind of inexplicable. We've recently had a few resignations at MTA um, and at one of the major advocacy groups. I don't know for sure yet, but it seems hard to believe it doesn't have something to do with this mess, you know, because this is kind of the marquee project of uh, the SFMTA right now. Yeah. Uh, and it's obviously not going very well, as these videos illustrate pretty clearly. So I don't know what to say. I mean, I've reported on this exhaustively. Um, as of other journalists in the Bay Area, I, I mean, I'm, I'm hardly alone on this. I mean, the, the crashes have been reported on and, and um, kind of our hyper local publication, Mission Local, which, you know, that's their territory. And the San Francisco Chronicle has reported on it. 
I don't know why this continues, but it seems as if MTA invested in something that I think a lot of us, you know, knew from precedent of the Netherlands and other countries was going to fail. The few examples we have of this uh, in other cities and other countries that had similar problems. And, you know, I, I want to point out there are edge cases where a center running bike lane kind of makes sense. There are some of them in New York City on bridge approaches, for example, where kind of if you're looking at the Williamsburg Bridge, you've got, you know, the, the bike lane or the bike space on the bridge is kind of towards the center. So as the roads approach the bridge, you've got to build center running approaches. Same with the Brooklyn Bridge. But they put really robust Jersey barriers up and the streets on the approaches. They're, they're not really commercial corridors like Valencia is. So like this was a bad idea. A lot of people thought it was a good idea. As we see from the videos, it turned out the people who thought it was a bad idea were right. But at this point, we've kind of got this bureaucratic inertia that they're they're invested in this design and they're just going to keep denying and denying and denying like the, you know, the, the poor guy who got killed. But, you know, I mean, how absurd is it to claim that had nothing to do with the street? I mean, sure, you can you can't definitively say that in most cases that any crash or any tragedy has to do with the design of the street, but it's, it's a little strange that, you know, what, two months after it officially opened, somebody's already dead and we have at least three other injuries that required an ambulance to be called. That's probably more than that. So yeah, I, I haven't got a great answer for you. I mean, we know what should be done. Uh, the thing we can't answer is why isn't it being done? Right. Yeah, no, I, I think to your question about pedestrianization, you know, I think ultimately what this boils down to, as you noted, and as I've advocated and pointed out, pedestrianization can still allow for commercial deliveries. It can allow for local residents to access their garages. Um, and so that's abundantly clear what we're lacking besides, you know, political will and leadership is vision from SFMTA and from the city to do something that is new, but is also proven to work and is proven to be really great. And so, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, surely there will be some merchants who would oppose pedestrianization because they're not transportation planners. They're not, you know, they haven't studied these things from around the world. They're local business owners who are just trying to survive and keep their business alive. And, and a lot of them are drivers. So they, they just see everything as an obstacle, you know, and that, that's not unique to Valencia. I mean, that's, yeah, no, and, and, and the great thing is, is that we have examples from around the world and notably New York City and Times Square and Broadway where, you know, elected officials and policymakers were visionary, were courageous, and were data-oriented and said, hey, we're going to do this thing because it's proven to work and we're going we're gonna to really do a good job to make sure it's successful. And by and large, those things have been wildly successful. You know, the pedestrianized parts of Broadway – Times Square pedestrian plaza, and ultimately what all of those things boil down to, and, and this includes Emeryville and other cities that have done progressive things around transportation and active transportation, is elected officials, policymakers, and in our case, and you know we live in a strong mayor city, the mayor saying, you know, having a mayor who says, hey, we're going to do something that's visionary, but it's going to move us forward in the right direction. And right now we lack that. We have a reactionary mayor and a reactionary city government that basically reacts to catastrophes. There's very little vision and foresight to like move the city forward in a progressive way. And so ultimately that's, you know, that's part of the reason why pedestrianization isn't happening because the city is, is essentially scared to do anything new or different I mean, except for the center bike lane, which <laughs> except for this, which like, is very new and very different. Um, yeah, I mean, you you have to you new have and different to, isn't always good. Well, yeah, I mean, at some at some level, you know, I I can appreciate the fact that they they got creative and did something, but at the same time, you know, having the you know, awareness, especially in, in looking at some of the other center bike lane, notable examples around the country that have, you know, have been installed and the challenges that they, they present be like, yeah, okay. You know, some of the things that probably should have been thought about or some of these dangerous movements that are happening, you know, across the, the, the lanes, et cetera, uh, the challenges that are associated with that and getting back to what we were talking about before about what's true protection versus, you know, you know, 
wannabe protection is, is like, yeah, if these were the sort of the, the, the low format Jersey barriers instead of these mountable plastic things, you know, you, we might be looking at a different scenario where we're not seeing these movements of motor vehicles uh, across them and, and really and, and using them as the left turn lanes and things of that nature. Uh, but the other thing that really kind of jumps out and the reason I freeze frame this is just how wide this street really is. Yeah, there's plenty of room to do everything that needs to be done on the street. It's, it's absurd for people. And I hear that actually from time to time. People say Valencia is a narrow street. No, it isn't. You know, maybe by California standards, it's a little narrow, but yeah, by international standards, it's enormous. Something else I just want to note is, you know, I, I am a, I'm a former designer and I understand the, the design process and an approach to design. And, and what I understand here is, that's FMTA took a very narrow look at this project. It was supposed to be about safety for people on bikes. And they, they clearly created a list of the problems. And the problem list was double park cars in the bike lane. So that was it. And it was just like, that's the problem. How do we solve that? Therefore, a center bikeway, you're like, that solves the problem. People won't double park in the bike lane anymore. Unfortunately, it creates a, a whole ton of unintended consequences and doesn't move us forward and, and isn't proven. You know, it's, it's a new thing, but it's backed up by no data versus curbside protected bike lanes, which I'll just briefly note, if you actually go back quickly to the photo of the curbside protected bike lanes on Valencia, um, I, I will note that we know because SFMTA did two different evaluations of that section of Valencia Street, that those curbside protected bike lanes reduce double parking in the bike lane by 99%. They reduce close calls by 100%. This section worked, so let's not do more. Yeah, this worked. Yeah, and they, and they increased, correct. So it you know, reduced double parking in the bike lane by 99%. It reduced uh, close calls by 100%. And the number of people biking on that stretch of Valencia increased 49%. So like phenomenally successful. It's like data that you, you just want to celebrate and you just want to put it out there every year. Like this works, here we go. We're going to do it elsewhere because look, like this data, we back it up. What a shock the the orientation that worked everywhere else in the world worked in San Francisco too. Remarkable how that happens. It, it, is, it is dumbfounding and infuriating that the agency and the mayor is essentially ignoring that data and, and proven best practices around the world essentially to try and solve a political problem at the cost of people's lives in the planet. Like that is inexcusable. John, if you want to switch over, there's actually a merchant corridor just across the Bay in Oakland on Telegraph where they actually put really robust curbside protected bike lanes in. Uh, and they started out with plastic posts and, uh, you know, parking protected. And it was similarly contentious, but I think more rational minds prevailed in that case. And we got, you know, we have a really great project, which is being finished up as we speak. There's crews out there uh, putting kind of the last touches of paint on there. So um, I don't know if you want to cue that up, but it's. Uh, yeah. So 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 this is this is Telegraph. So this is uh, this is kind of uh, another one of the videos that uh, Clarence put together. Yeah. So walk us through this. So this is, uh, as I mentioned, it's under construction. You can see some of the paint is, is still not completed. But basically, they put these large islands down to make sure that you have daylighting at the intersections. So this is actually an improvement over the parking protected section of Valencia. Um, but this is just across the bay in Oakland. So, you know, we, we don't even have to go to New York City. We don't have to go to the Netherlands. Uh, you can just take BART for 15, 20 minutes and ride on this, and you know we have similar numbers that show that this works and it's safe. And actually, some of the people uh, who are currently at MTA uh, help design this. So it's just utterly bizarre that they would turn away from global best practices and build a center running bike lane in Valencia. When you know, again, I, I to me it would be inexcusable if the planners at MTA were not familiar with with global best practices. But even if they weren't, they can. Just go, you know, visit Oakland for a couple of hours and see this in operation. I think it's I think it's rather clear from what you have both said that it's not that the planners don't get it. They would probably love to do this. It's what you were saying earlier. It's this is a political thing and we don't know who and we don't know exactly I would assume, or maybe we do, but we're not going to say. Uh, but, you know, but yeah, I mean, it, this is obviously, this is politics. And, you know, and, and this is once again about parking. Yeah. 
over life. Yep. Yeah. And, and I will, and I will, you know, I think, I think to that point, John, I think it's, it's really important for me and for other advocates and organizers to know is that oftentimes people will be like, we don't want to make this stuff political. We just want to make streets safer. We want to help people shift trips. And I think, especially in San Francisco, a fiercely political city, that is just not the reality of things. You know, politics are a massive lever, if not the only lever in many of these things. And we see that in the negative way, like in San Francisco, where the Valencia Street Center bikeway was approved and installed. But we also see them in the positive way. You know, notably, I mentioned Cambridge earlier, Cambridge Cycling or, Safety. Or what we just saw in Oakland, Luke. The, the DOT head at the time didn't want to do that and got overruled by the city council. Yeah. And, and, and you know, in, in, in Cambridge, Cambridge Cycling Safety organized people, found candidates, got them to pledge to support the cycling safety ordinance and got seven of nine city councilors elected who supported the ordinance. And so therefore, months after being elected, they passed the ordinance. And so it was really easy. You know, and then elsewhere, you look at Emeryville, California, John Bowders was elected, became mayor, and he believes in this stuff. And he, he sees the vision, he has the vision, and he's willing to be empathetic and compassionate and communicate the data. But he's also like, we're going to do this. And so ultimately, this stuff is politics. And I think the sooner organizers and advocates realize that they need to play politics, and sometimes that politics is not like rah, rah and patting everyone on the back. Sometimes it's, it's like a blood sport. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Well, and and yes, to 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 your point that you know all of this is about politics because ultimately you know a budget is a reflection of you know the the, the policies and the politics that are involved, and so politics are it's not a it's not a dirty word and a nasty word. It, it it's like we we do need to get engaged and we do need to get involved. I'm going to shift gears to, to Vision Zero Conference. Uh, Roger, you couldn't make it uh, to to the conference. You were supposed to be there. You had you were laid up with an injury. You couldn't go, but Luke was able to make it. And if I zoom in on this photo, I see not one, not two, but three three past guests on the Active Towns podcast. Luke, talk about this, man. This is this is the Vision Zero conference, but this was also like a little bike bus meetup. Oh, there's, and there, and yeah, there's Clarence too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I first want to acknowledge and appreciate uh, Transportation Alternatives, Danny Harris, um, Elizabeth Adams, and the whole team that, that set up the Vision Zero Cities conference, uh, really well put on conference, lots of great activities and uh, sessions um, and networking that happened there. Um, and this, you know, this was part of that conference. So there was a kind of a field tour that was about how to start a bike bus. And so it was like going out. We we did a bike bus route in Brooklyn with Emily Stutz, who who leads the Bergen bike bus there, and also had Sam Balto or Coach Balto from Portland, Oregon, uh, and Megan Ramey from um, Fort Hood, uh, Fort Hood River, yeah, Hood River. Sorry, and yeah. So we you know we rode around. We talked about bike buses, how to start them the impact that they have, answered questions, and really just like harness the joy and positivity um, and transformational power of bike bus that, that exists throughout the country and throughout the world. And there's just a lot of energy, a lot of positive energy around bike bus. And, and we just really want to harness that and help grow that. And, and just in case anyone's curious, a bike bus is essentially children and families riding their bikes to school together. So it essentially, you know, it provides safety in numbers, but more, more importantly, it provides a healthy start to the day. It provides a social opportunity for kids to hang out with their, their friends. And it provides families a really easy, safe, and joyful way to shift some trips from, you know, cars to active transportation. Yeah. And, and you all have been doing bike bus stuff in San Francisco for a while, right? Yeah, I, I helped to kind of start SF Bike Bus and get some of the bike buses going here alongside uh, Peter Belden uh, and Molly Hayden to really help people shift trips and have a great time getting to school and introduce kids and families to to bike buses and biking to school. Um, and so, you know, we, we have a, we've had a few bike buses here in San Francisco. Um, notably, we had a bike bus that started on car-free JFK Promenade, went on to Page Slow Street, 
and then went to kind of like the, the center of, of San Francisco. And that started during the pandemic and before Car Free JFK became permanent. And so, you know, to the discussion earlier about politics, for me, there was, a, there was absolutely a strategic decision made around having the bike bus start on Car Free JFK, which at the time was only temporary. And there was a vote coming up. And having it start there and go on slow streets, which were only temporary and had a vote coming up. And to not only have it start there and have it take place on those spaces and take photos and videos, and you know, obviously that becomes viral and spreads joy um, and, and inspires other people, but also got elected officials, you know, notably two kind of swing boat supervisors to come on a bike bus on JFK and on Page Slow Street, who then later voted in support of Car Free JFK. And for what it's worth, they represent more conservative, more car intensive neighborhoods and districts in the city. And they both supported Car Free JFK and helped pass it. You know, it passed seven to four. And without those two votes, it, it wouldn't have passed. And, uh, you know, they came out, they spoke to the bike bus group, they rode with us. Um, and it was clear they, they understood the value of the car free space, the slow street, and of bike bus. And, and so I think going back to the politics side, Bike bus represents not only a transformative tool to get families biking to school and, and addressing our roadway safety crisis, our climate crisis, and our public health crisis, but also represents a, a very great political tool to help get elected officials and policymakers on board as well. Now, is this a, is this a new uh, thing, bike bus world? Yeah, yeah. So um, alongside Sam Balto, Coach Balto, and uh, Jess and Andy from the um, from the Montclair Bike Bus, you know, we're we're putting together Bike Bus World, and this is an initiative to help more families and teachers and and children start riding to school through bike buses and help spread bike bus throughout the country and and grow that movement because you know we're also seeing. The, the other great thing about bike buses is that people who organize bike buses and take part in bike buses pretty quickly become advocates and organizers themselves because they see the value of biking, they see the value of active transportation infrastructure, and so they want to get more involved. Um, Sam is a great example of that. He just started a bike bus for Earth Day, got a bunch of kids and families to ride, and then all of a sudden he has just fully dove down the rabbit hole of active transportation infrastructure and policy. Um, And so we see an amazing opportunity there to capture that organic grassroots movement and grow it throughout the country and and really scale that impact to many more cities around the country and, you know, at the federal level as well. Yeah. So I've got some uh, of the footage here from uh, Clarence's uh, Car Free uh, JFK. Let's uh, let's close this out, this discussion out, talking about another positive win that this represents. Uh, Roger, start us off. Sure. Um, so uh, one of the main uh, previously thoroughfares through uh, Golden Gate Park was uh, JFK Drive, previously JFK Drive. Um, and believe it or not, for the better part of four decades, uh, advocates had been making the point that, you know, maybe we shouldn't have an automobile thoroughfare through our main park. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Roger. What do you mean? There shouldn't, there shouldn't be an yeah. auto sewer through your park. <laughs> no, we, 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 we feel like, and you know, I'm, I'm not a, you know, an objective journalist. I'm an advocacy journalist. So I can say upfront, I do not think there should be a traffic sewer in Golden Gate Park or any other park. Uh, that's not what parks are for. And finally, after a battle that I thought was going to kill us all, we finally got uh, half of JFK, uh, and this actually, for details I won't get into, gives us a, a more or less car-free route through the entire park. And we turned this part of JFK into the JFK Promenade. And uh, a local arts advocacy group came in and, and installed all these art installations that you see in these pictures. And, you know, this was a celebratory ride that we went with and uh, Clarence documented. And it's just, you know, I hope everyone who lives in San Francisco obviously has been there, but anybody who comes to visit, like, just make sure it's on your itinerary. You know, don't even come to San Francisco if you're not going to come to see the JFK Promenade because it is You you have to, it's like a passport. You got it. It has to be. You have to have it on your stamp or (laughs) they'll turn you back at SFO and send you back to the park. But, you know, the difference um, between just the feel of the park now, um, you know, whether you're on foot or whether you're 
riding a bike. Oh, and this is, <laughs> I guess I could get into the details of this. I love this photograph. Um, that's Dee Dee Wilsey, who's kind of a, an inherited, uh, she inherited the fortune of the DuPont chemical fa- uh, family. We can get into all that later, but she is basically the benefactor of the De Young Museum, the big art museum in, uh, in Golden Gate Park. And they were kind of the, the, our arch enemies in this whole battle. They were fighting like hell to keep cars like we see in these old pictures of uh, flying back and forth through JFK because it was how the, um, I guess the directors of the museum got, you know, their limousines to the museum when they had their meetings. We screwed them up a little bit. They couldn't do it anymore. Um, the irony of all that is there's an 800 space parking garage constructed under the park with access to all the adjacent roads. So like you can still drive to the museum. It's, it's not a problem. That parking garage never fills up. So anyway, uh, there was this picture of her for, uh, I think it was an architectural magazine. I forgot. Oh, no, sorry. It was the Chronicle for, I think, an architectural article. But uh, just that picture of her with a little dog, I thought it went so perfectly because <laughs> she, uh, sorry, I've never met the woman, but, uh, you know, she, she looks kind of cartoonish and they're like kind of a Disney villain. So I use that picture with an article about um, sort of a, an investigative piece, like getting into how the de Young was funding um, the so-called grassroots effort to uh, keep cars and on JFK Drive to ensure that everyone can get to the park because, you know, if you can't drive to the park specifically on JFK, there's no way to get to the museums, which of course, you know, is absurd because you've got the underground parking garage with access from both sides of the park to the local street. So it's, it was always silly, but, but anyway, um, yeah, it, it, again, it almost killed us because we are not, uh, you know, Luke certainly is not a professional advocate in the sense that nobody's writing him big checks to do all this work. And he worked his butt off as did a lot of other people. And ultimately, we were successful. Um, and we have pictures here of the Great Highway as well, which that was a victory of sorts. Luke, do you want to talk a little bit about where we stand now with the Great Highway Park? Yeah, yeah. And I, I think just to put a put a pin in the, you know, your point, Roger, about the people involved, you know, this was inherently a grassroots organizing effort. You know, the, the part of JFK Drive that was made car free during the pandemic was made purely temporary. It was just going to be for the pandemic. Yeah, it was going to be just for the pandemic. And, and, you know, I got out there and started organizing people, you know, with at first just an email to city policymakers and then a petition. And that, you know, grew to over 5,000 people. And then other advocacy organizations, you know, formal advocacy organizations got involved and started rallying people as well. And that kind of grassroots organizing absolutely made this happen. And, you know, and then there was direct advocacy that I was doing with, you know, supervisors. So, you know, it all goes into that. But it was grassroots versus AstroTurf versus a well-funded AstroTurf campaign. And for once, the grassroots side won. Yeah. And actually, it's the reason we won ultimately. and, And Luke, you can... You can disagree with me. I'm not sure. I think you agree with me on this. But the AstroTurf side, the, the de Young, they basically backed a, a petition drive to get a ballot measure um, to let cars go on JFK again. And they lost badly. So like they pushed to get it on the ballot instead of going with what the Board of Supervisors had decided. And then they lost, which locked it in forever and ever. The only way to undo it now is to have another ballot initiative. So yeah, they, yeah. they really shot themselves in the foot, which well, um, I, I think that that's a really important thing to, to, to note is that oftentimes these difficult challenges that we fight hard to, to, you know, to, to get put in place, people are very, very hesitant at first and people, many are skeptical about it, but then, you know, you, you get it done and it's like, then, then the public is like, oh, this is really cool. And oh, those things that I was really afraid of, those, those fears didn't materialize and you put it to the voters for a vote and what they're like, no, 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 we don't want to go back. Yep. Yeah. And they were surprised when you talk to the average person on the street uh, around Golden Gate Park and explain to them that there was going to be a ballot initiative to put cars back on JFK. They're like, what? Like, who would do that? Like, why would you want to do that? So it was an easy sell. I will, you know, I will just, I will add that, you know, the, the grassroots element of this is really critical. And, and specifically, something that I, I would love to pass on to other organizers and advocates out there is that a common... A common um, 
flaw I, I see that people take, and I've been guilty of this many times, is to focus on people who disagree with you or who are moderately disagreeing with you and you want to win them over. And what I focused on with JFK and what I would encourage other organizers and advocates to do is focus on the massive part of the population that is completely unengaged on a topic. So they have no idea that there's a vote on this. They have no idea how to even contact an elected official. They have no idea how to influence something. And you want to give them that tool in as easy a way as possible to engage civically. And doing that essentially grows the, the pie of how people are engaged in the civic process and dramatically shifts the dynamics around politics. And so, you know, that's Bike Bus helped with that. Uh, grassroots organizing and canvassing helped with that. Um, and so that's, you know, I would, I would impart that on other people um, to encourage them to do that in their city with their project, you know, start early and often and get as many unengaged people engaged and on your side of the issue. But, you know, here you can see a video of uh, one of our one of our bike buses on Car Free JFK Promenade. Um, and, you know, this was before it was voted to be made permanent. And so it's, it's impossible to, like, watch this and say that this is not feel incredible joy inside and say, like, we want to encourage more of this. And so the connection is so easy for elected officials and policymakers to be like, oh, this is a really positive thing. And this space enables that positive thing. How do I support this? And you're like, I'm so glad you asked. You just vote for this thing. Um, and it just changes that dynamic and the discussion. Yeah, good, good stuff. And Roger, just a shout out to Streets Blog and um, all the great work that you all do. And then Luke, the last word that you'll have is to say uh, one last thing about the the great highway park. Yeah, um, I mean, Streets Blog has been, you know, as I mentioned uh, at the start of this, uh, you know, it's been around for about 17 years in New York City. And now we've got uh, Streets Blogs and, you know, in National, we got Chicago, L.A., we had Denver for a while. They might come back sometime, but, and I, I wish we had a street blog Austin, but yeah, our job is to, you know, when, when advocates, I'm sorry, when cities are following best practices and doing really great things like the example you saw in Telegraph to shine a nice bright light on that and celebrate it and let interested people know what's going on and what they can support, you know, to shine a light on people like Luke advocates who are just working their butts off to try and make a better city. Um, and also to, you know, highlight when DOTs do, you know, for lack of a better term, brain farts like the center running bike lane on Valencia, you know, or, or, uh, or even or even worse, it's, yeah. it, you know, it's not really a brain fart. It's like it's being done intentionally. Yeah, yeah, it's not. You're right. <laughs> the, the MTA didn't, you know, walk into a tree and suddenly say, oh, yeah, let's do a center running. No, it, it was actually discussed for months. It's really incredible. But anyway, yeah, that's, you know, that's our job. And, you know, uh, you and I met for the first time in uh, Leipzig, Germany this year at the Velo Cities Conference. And so, you know, it's also my job to stay educated on what's going on in the Netherlands and elsewhere and in, in places where they've actually accomplished what we say we want to do, which is, you know, Vision Zero to have essentially no fatal or serious uh, injury collisions every year. And we're, you know, as Luke pointed out earlier, we're actually going in the wrong direction pretty much uh, almost everywhere in the U.S., but not everywhere. I mean, Hoboken is a notable exception. And so, you know, our, our job is to kind of cheerlead all this and influence the, the regular press as well to get stuff out to, you know, the, that body of people that Luke was highlighting that, you know, are, are not necessarily engaged in, in street safety issues and, you know, don't know what a Wunerif is, um, <laughs> and we don't know how to pronounce it, but, <laughs> but they know that they like it. Um, and that's something that I see over and over and over again, that, you know, someone comes back from the Netherlands and yeah, I mean, you know, they haven't dedicated their life to transportation and transit, but they're like, God, that's, that was so nice. Why can't we have that here? Or they go to JFK and they, you know, they walk down the promenade and say, wow, why don't, why don't we do this in our park? Why don't we, you know, do this with our street like you know um the attention we you know we just got past halloween right the the day with the highest number of children getting run over and you know like our job at streets blog is to make that thank, stop. thank okay. you for doing what you do there at streets blog luke close us out here with uh just a, a quick word um sort of answering uh uh roger's suggestion or question about the great highway park yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and first and foremost, 
very appreciative of Roger and the entire Streets Blog Network's work to elevate this work, you know, call out, you know, when agencies or cities are not doing a good job and, and really help us move forward to this, this future that we need to go to. So very appreciative of that. Yeah, I mean, as far as Great Highway Park goes, for those who don't know, Great Highway Park is also known as Upper Great Highway. It runs along the Pacific Ocean. It's a two-mile stretch uh, along the Pacific Ocean um, that also during the pandemic was closed to cars, open to people 24-7. And when that happened, people's eyes were open to, wow, we can have this great public space to recreate, to gather, to connect, to transport ourselves using active transportation right along the Pacific Ocean. And so it really opened people's eyes and people started saying, hey, we should have this permanently after the pandemic. Um, and so similarly there to, to JFK, I helped kind of lead organizing around um, Great Highway Park to get people to support making that a permanent park. And so unfortunately, we've had a step backwards in that, you know, Mayor Breed reopened or opened Closed, you know, closed Great Highway Park to people and opened it to cars Monday at 6 a.m. to Friday at 12 p.m. So that was a setback. We did fortunately rally people, organize people and advocate for keeping that configuration until December of 2025. So that is now codified until the December of 2025. But we're, you know, actively and I am actively working to organize people and advocate for making that a permanent park 24-7 as soon as possible. We shouldn't have to wait until December 2025. To do it, it only takes a vote of our Board of Supervisors, and we can do it just, you know, just as quickly as we want to. Push push hard, push hard, make it happen. And this is this is part of the footage uh, of, of the Great Highway, right? Yeah, yeah, this was from that same ride that started in uh, on Carver JFK Promenade. And, you know, you can see here it's, it's a it's a four lane four lane road along Pacific Ocean, and you know, unfortunately, because cars are allowed on it um, during the week, you can't the city can't install permanent infrastructure like tables and chairs and bathrooms. And so, it's it's a massive opportunity for our city for a visionary leader or leaders who actually want to move our city forward and and do some really positive stuff in the city. It's just sitting there waiting waiting for someone to just pick it up. And so, you know, we have a mayoral election coming up in November 2024, and it would be great to see some mayoral candidates saying, hey, let's make that happen immediately. Like, this is a no-brainer. Let's do it. We'll be celebrated around the world. Great Highway Park was recognized by the New York Times as one of the 50 places from the pandemic to visit. I mean, this is, it's a, it's a slam dunk winner for an elected official or policymaker who just has the courage to Pick, pick the football up and run with it. It's it's right there for well, soccer ball. I know that both of you are going to work hard to to mobilize the community uh, to to try to get to that end. Uh, Roger, Luke, thank you both so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This has been an absolute joy and pleasure. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me, John. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Roger and Luke. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means a lot to me. Uh, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.